So today we are going to be working on intro, Introduction to Networking, which is uh, Chapter 5. So um, moving right along, okay? Um, we'll get started, and um, we might have some students adding as we uh, go, um, and we'll just we'll just work with that. And of course, if there's any questions and so forth as we go, just shout or raise your hand or put it in the chat, and that'll work. So here we are in the class, Networking Concepts, and... Um, kind of go into through the introduction and so forth. Um, not that we necessarily need the whole introduction. Let's see, of note, um, we're gonna be talking about, um, there's some different standards in networking and standards are, are, are interesting because we have to um, have some kind of a standard so that we can have computer equipment that talks to each other. So for example, an example of a standard would be like VHS videotapes versus beta, if you can remember back in the day, um, or, you know, the standard uh, we in networking, we have the 802 standards, the 802.11, for example, with a wireless LAN, and we'll be talking about that. Um, we will be talking about things like uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave, and um, we'll be talking about um, the layers of the TCP IP um, layers that we'll be talking about, including, um, you know, kind of how packet traffic goes from one place to another and really kind of um, look at that uh, whole concept. So at any rate, let's just get going and just dive in. The first thing they're going to do is uh, introduce us to some devices um, and the icons that they use. So um, one of the things that can be kind of confusing at first in networking is the idea of the, uh, what a host is. A lot of times people think a host is like a server, but any a host in a networking environment is anything that has an IP address, okay? Anything that has an IP address. So that would include your computer, you know, your mobile device and so forth that's hooked into a network. So um, these are host device icons. So we have that we do have servers um, and printers and scanners and smartphones, cameras, tablets. You get the idea. These are host devices. OK, um, the networking devices that we're going to refer to are called intermediary devices, and they include things like switches, routers and access points and so forth. Let's take a look at some of those icons. So we have a router, a wireless router, a modem, an access point. Uh, switch. These are all intermediary device icons. Okay. And so these are kind of basically networking um, devices. And finally, um, we have network media icons. And so what network media means is the cabling or the wireless in, the, in that case and, and how that's um, propagated. So for example, with the LAN, LAN stands for local area network, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, that's represented as a line. So you might have a computer connected uh, to a uh, by a, this black line to a hub or a switch, and that would kind of show that it's uh, this is LAN media. It's a cable. A WAN um, WAN stands for Wide Area Network. Um, that's locate um, looks like this a little lightning bolt here. Okay. Um, we'll talk about LANs and WANs and talk about the definition of that in a moment. Um, wireless media is nomenclated with this. Um, um, with this wave here, um, a network cloud or the internet is represented as a cloud, of course. So we'll get into that now um, and get a little deeper into this thing. Um, so the instructions here, we're going to talk about the different kind of topologies. So PAN, right? I don't know if you've heard about a PAN before, but PAN stands for personal area network, right? So we have, you know, things like um, Bluetooth and so forth uh, with you know, kind of in a, create a network within our personal area and so forth. And so um, that might be between us and say 30 feet away, uh, as an example, maybe even more these days, okay? Um, so that stands for personal area network. And again, if there's questions, just shout it out. Um, here's a LAN, local area network. Now, traditionally we used to say a LAN was a network that was limited to a smaller geographical area. And that might be the case still. However, one of the things that we should know about a LAN, it's a network basically that's under a single um, authority. For example, like um, you might have a LAN at your home and you are in charge of the LAN because you know the wireless access point password and you're the one that sets it up. And so that's kind of, you're the central authority for that LAN. Um, and so um, they say it's typically owned by an individual such as a home or small business or wholly managed by an IT department such as a school. So a LAN can be as small as two computers in someone's you know, dorm room connected together all the way up to the size of a, you know, say a high rise building, a college campus, a hospital, 
um, you get the idea. And like, for example, um, the Santa Rosa.edu uh, land we have is between, not only do we have different locations, but um, you know, we actually use a WAN link between like, say for example, Santa Rosa and Petaluma. Um, we have, we run a piece of fiber right down the freeway actually um, that uh, connects the two campuses together as well as other things. It's kind of a backbone that goes through that uh, corridor. So, um, so, but we refer to all the different locations as our land. Okay. Now VLAN. Okay. Now VLAN is an interesting concept because we're, what we're talking about is a virtual LAN. And that is that we are, we can separate the, the network that we have into separate, separate segments. Okay. By constructing inside of the switches, for example, here, we are setting the switches up to be on a different VLAN. And what happens is that we can call it something different. We can kind of treat it as if it's a separate network sometimes, um, depending on how we configure it. So that's what a VLAN is. Now, um, a WLAN is just, you know, like what you might have at home, a wireless local area network, okay? Um, we might have some devices that are wired, into it. Um, most devices might be wireless, okay, but we call that a WLAN, okay. Um, let's see, a WMN, a wireless mesh network. So what's the difference between, say, a WLAN and a wireless mesh network? Well, with a wireless mesh network, we're using multiple access points to extend the, the um, WLAN. Um, the this topology right here shows a wireless router, two wireless um, um, access points extend the reach of the WLAN within the home. Similarly, businesses and municipalities can use WMNs to quickly add new areas of coverage, okay? So you can create basically an ad hoc mesh network as needed, um, you know, with a WMN, a wireless mesh network. Pretty cool. Um, another sir, one, uh, yeah, please. Sir, so all of them, they, they're gonna get the connection from the same source modem, or if anything happened to one of them, so all of them will lose the connections, right? Well, so for example, if you know, you're know you connected to the internet via this um, bridge or modem or, or what have you, depending on the technology, right? So if that goes out, basically the whole mesh network here is gonna not have internet, right? Because as, as I hear, uh, it says that the use to the army was using this one because they don't want any, uh, you know, connection, mis misconnections happens because if one of wires disconnected or damaged, so that will have a different connection from different way so they can sure. use that. Yeah, sure. As, as, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's totally, you can, you can do that. And it is versatile like that. You can, um, and, you know, kind of create better coverage over the entire area, whether it's wired or wireless um, that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Um, here's a MAN. This is a metropolitan area network, right? You might not have heard of that before, but a metropolitan area network is often a network that kind of spans, you know, kind of a downtown area. Um, usually it might be some kind of a leased fiber um, ring type of network that goes between high rise buildings and so forth. Um, it can work like that. Um, so when, we, when it's in that kind of an infrastructure, we refer to it as a metropolitan area network. Okay. Um, usually using fiber optics. Okay. Now here's a WAN. And WAN is, um, now we used to say in the back in the day, a WAN is a network that's, um, you know, a wide geographical area, which is mostly true. However, um, usually a WAN is a leased line from some kind of a telecommunications provider. Okay. Whether it's AT&T or some kind of an other a company that you're leasing a line or an access uh, to this WAN. Um, you know, it's kind of funny, back in the day, a lot of the railroad companies got into um, making networks and long distance lines and so forth. You know, do you know why a railroad company would be able to um, get into that business? What does a railroad have? They have telephones. They have right of way. So they already have right of way. So they don't have to dig a trench underneath houses and things like that to run a wire. Okay. They can run the wire right down the railroad. So um, that, that was one of the kind of easy things for the railroad companies to get into and, and actually start making money. Um, just kind of just a funny enough story. Um, so a, a WAN basically can be um, 
you know, the internet's example of the world's largest WAN, okay, but uh, did we have a WAN link between Santa Rosa and Petaluma at here at the JC network, okay, it's using a leased line. Um, so the definition that we used to use these things more has, has changed a little bit. Use, now a WAN means that it, a WAN is a link that connects different LANs together, okay, but it usually comes from some kind of a telecommunications provider, okay? So there's that. Now, VPN, VPN stands for a virtual private network, okay? What VPN simply does is it uses, I mean, I say simply, but it's actually complicated. Uh, it uses encryption so that anyone in the middle that would intercept any of that data, those data packets or whatever, would not be able to read what they're looking at because they don't have the cipher, the key to the encryption. So basically when you're working on a VPN, you are working on an encrypted data stream and you're sending out encrypted data, you're receiving encrypted data, okay? A VPN needs to be set up beforehand. Um, and um, um, however, they do have um, different types of VPNs now where you can just like, you know, where you uh, sign up for like say NordVPN or, or whatever, and you can use that when you need to um, have that, say, anonymity um, uh, uh, on the on a network, for example. Um, VPNs are really interesting and um, really kind of neat uh, to check it out. Let's see what they say. Most of the common VPN used by teleworkers to access a corporate private network. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes. Yeah. So in the in the example here, we have two teleworkers and they're accessing the. Um, the network at the uh, at, at the corporate network. Now, did they say they go through this VPN tunnel? There's not really a tunnel, okay? That tunnel is basically representing the encryption that, um, that so for all intents and purposes, it's like it's its own tunnel, it's private, okay? All right, cool. Um, let's see here, moving on, good. Good stuff. Okay, so let's do a checker understanding. So connects devices in close proximity to the user, usually Bluetooth, that's gonna be a PAN. Okay, personal area network typically uses a wire uh, cable to connect devices to a switch in a small geographical area. That's probably a LAN. Let's take a look. Uh, can extend beyond traditional LANs and group users based on administratively defined boundaries instead of physical boundaries. That would be a VLAN probably. Um, a LAN that wirelessly connects devices to a network. That would be a WLAN. Uh, wireless uh, access points connected together to extend the range. That would be a mesh network. So um, wireless mesh network, WMN. Um, a network that spans across the city. That would be a, a MAN, a metropolitan area network. Um, this one uh, connects across a large geographical distance, such as the internet. That would be a WAN. Um, and then allows users to securely connect to another network across un unsecured networks. So that would be a VPN. Uh, you guys concur? Any changes? Let's check it and see. Nice. Okay, good. All right, moving on. Okay, so um, they're going to be talking about different types of technologies in this case. And I just want to kind of bring up the vocabulary. Um, you know, you can read through the history, but of note, um, is that so? For example, um, we for the longest time we were using analog telephone lines. In analog telephone, we sometimes refer to as POTS, P O T S, plain old telephone system. Okay. Um, so um, back in the day, we used to use a modem to um, connect to different networks uh, over an analog telephone line. Analog meaning using waves and not a digital line, like say DSL, for example. Okay. Now what? Uh, what started happening was um, they created these actual digital phone lines, which um, was, was referred to as ISDN or Integrated Service Digital Network, okay? Um, and that used multiple channels to carry different types of signals on, um, on a telephone line. Um, now, that is the idea of pre when you're sending multiple signals down a single source, that's the idea of what broadband is, okay? So, for example... Broadband can include things like DSL. DSL will include your internet traffic as, as well as your telephone service, okay? Um, DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line. 
you might also, or you might have, instead of, you might have cable internet, right? So you're using a coaxial cable that comes in from the cable company. It's broadband in the way that it sends you not only your TV signal, you know, HBO and whatever stuff that you get, but you're also, um, facilitates your internet traffic and your network traffic on that same line. That's why we refer to it as broadband, okay? Um, sometimes, um, you know, if you're out in the sticks and there's no other way to get a wire out to you, um, you can get a, on a, to the internet via satellite, okay? And that's getting going to get better. You know, if you look up in the sky these days, there's a lot more stars out there, okay? They ain't stars, baby. Those are satellites. And those satellites are in a low Earth orbit in a geostationary or geosynchronous orbit that's coming around. Um, people like um, Elon Musk, right, are putting up the um, with Starlink network uh, satellites, as well as Jeff Bezos and, and, uh, and, a, and a couple other companies that are putting up thousands of satellites. And so, um, you know, kind of one of the problems with that is that it creates kind of light pollution. That's one of the things, but it also creates a hazard for um, other things up in space to collide with each other. Um, but what it allows is basically anybody on earth that doesn't have an internet connection, I mean, basically will be able to have an internet connection, hopefully for low cost, if not, you know, if it was my network, I would make it free and just do all the advertising, but who knows what's gonna happen with that. Um, so, um, so they're putting up thousands of satellites to do this kind of thing. So look out, look out um, some night tonight, you know, go outside, look outside and see that, that there's interesting stars. Even better, you can use a program on your phone called Starwalk and you can just point it and it'll show you what you're looking at in the sky and it'll tell you satellite, satellite, satellite and so forth. And if you pay money for it, like if you, you know, you can actually find out where, where the satellite's coming from. Anyway interesting stuff it's um it's kind of current events what's going on with um uh, networks these days okay cool beans um going on so we're going to be talking about in this case dsl cable and fiber these are all digital um technologies and digital means that basically instead of using waves uh, to make the sounds we're using ones and zeros basically discrete values to represent um, to represent the audio or the, the data signal and so forth. Um, in the case of DSL, basically they're modulating, meaning they're putting on the same wire broadband wise, they're modulating your voice as well as your data, okay? With cable, they're modulating your cable um, with, your, with your data as well. Now, cable has a tendency to use something called HFC, which stands for hybrid fiber coax, okay? What that means is it usually goes out fiber to the block where you're at, and then it breaks it down from fiber and has a, a device that takes it from fiber and um, turns it into coaxial uh, that can um, go down to basically where the drop where your house is, okay? So, um, but it goes usually fiber fr from whatever you know, kind of source that they're coming from. In the case of Comcast, I think they have some kind of a centralized repository um, and they send out, you know, fiber to all the different neighborhoods and then they break it down into coaxial cable from there. Um, fiber optic cable, sometimes people um, in some neighborhoods are getting it to the home, which is amazing because the speed limit of fiber optic is, you know, I mean, it's just, it keeps getting better and better and better depending on the terminal equipment that you're, that you're using. But fiber optics is interesting because not only do they change, they do multiplexing, which means putting a different, different signals on the same line at the same time. And they divide time, for example, they'll divide a uh, second into like 24 different parts and they'll modulate 24 different signals down that line uh, per second. But not only that, they can modulate with what, what they call wavelength division multiplexing, which is changing the color of the light. So you have different signals depending on what light frequency it is. Now, these are frequencies that we can't see with our eyes because they're outside of our visual range, but basically they're changing the, the color of the light to modulate different signals. And they can do this like 200 or more times down the same piece of glass that's as thin as your hair. Amazing shit, fiber optics. Um, and uh, the long distance fiber optics are different than the ones that you might find in a networking room. So um, we have what they call single mode fiber and then multi-mode fiber. I'm kind of a telecom geek if you, if you haven't figured out yet, but um, 
but um, it's, it's, it's amazing stuff. And um, actually, believe it or not, for a while, um, we were known as Telecom Alley uh, here in Petaluma. Um, and basically, we created the fiber optic switching equipment and, and so forth. How do they change the colors of the wavelength of the light? Well, they use prisms and shit like that. It's amazing stuff. It really is. So, so um, you know, kind of back to your physics class and optics and, and all kinds of fun stuff like that and lasers and grooviness. Ah, 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 I love it. Okay, moving on. Um, line of sight wireless. This is another way to get um, internet traffic and so forth. So line of sight can be, there's different technologies that you can use for this. You can use radio, okay? You can use microwave, okay? Uh, and you can also use laser uh, for line of sight, okay? Um, let's see, a line of sight wireless internet is always on service that uses radio in this case for transmitting internet access. Okay, radio signals are sent from a tower to the receiver that the customer connects. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to connect up to the network. Now, believe it or not, you know, that telephone that you put up to your ear all the time and so forth, that's a microwave transmitter. You're, that's microwaves going right next to your head. So just know that, right? So I, I, the jury's out. I mean, I don't think we all, and, you know, we're having tumors and so forth show up in our heads. Um, so, so I guess that's a good thing. But um, just know that that's a microwave transponder that's, you know, next to your head or in your pocket or, you know, or whatever. Um, but anyway, so yeah, um, a lot of times what happens is that data can go many different ways. And that's one of the interesting things about the internet is that, um, the way the internet set up is that, um, it divides the data that you are sending and receiving into these different parts called packets. And these packets might go many different ways through the network and meander, you know, kind of get their way through the network and eventually get to where they're supposed to go. It's kind of crazy that it actually works, but it does. But one of the things that's also happening is that when you are talking to someone that maybe be around the world, like on the other side of the world, you know, like for example, when CNN is talking to their correspondent in Iraq or, or whatever, a lot of times what happens is that it goes from the landline to a specific place like an antenna that basically shoots it up into space, okay? And then shoots it around the globe, okay? Um, and that's one of the things what happens is that, you know, you'll notice that you get this quarter second, what they call propagation delay. And basically at the speed of light, that's the amount of time it takes to get from the signal there and back. Okay. So that's why you have that delay when you're talking to somebody on the other side of the planet. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, interesting stuff. Um, you know, the whole way that your mobile phone works is amazing. And I don't know if you've ever looked at um, um, the cabling that they have underneath the ocean. They have, you know, there are tons of cables underneath the ocean between continents and between countries and so forth. And lots of times they're getting drug up by boat anchors and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it costs lots and lots of money to uh, put these cables in and divers and all this, you know, neat stuff. But um, as a matter of fact, let's actually go and um, look at submarine cables. So I'm just going to type in submarine cables. Now, believe it or not, one of the for one of the first or primary submarine cables that we've had was uh, one that goes from uh, Point Arena uh, to Hawaii. Believe it or not, as far as land location is, Point Arena is the closest space or the closest place to Hawaii um, from, the, from the mainland. And so there's a cable, literally that's even still there that we used to use for, for um, um, telephone and Point Arena. Um, let's take a look at images. Okay, so submarine cables, right? So these are armored cables that get put on the, you know, on the sea floor and goes between underwater, ca you know, chasms and and so forth and um, the boats that uh, or the ships I should say that go ahead and and um, that send these cables out there but um, more important than that not not more important but let's take a look at a map here for a second and just kind of kind of show you um, you can you can kind of see this let's see if I can get a, a, a larger version of this um, okay so if you look at this I mean these are all representing undersea cables that are you know, between countries, as you can see, between continents and so forth. Um, you know, here is the one that goes to Hawaii, that goes to Point Arena, and, you know, that's, I mean, it's there. So um, really, really interesting stuff. And um, that's a whole industry in and of itself is, is, um, is undersea cabling and, um, 
and, and diving and tapping into these things and spy versus spy and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's a kind of really neat stuff. So um, anyway, just kind of had to geek out on submarine cables for there for a minute, but check it out because they armor these cables with cable um, with um, different types of uh, uh, armor that they put on this satellites, right? So satellites are becoming more and more and more and more and more common. Okay. The problem with old satellite technology, where you have the satellites that are in a relatively high geosynchronous orbit, geosynchronous means it stays in the same place, um, you know, as the earth turns, um, you know, for example, like uh, if you have satellite TV, okay, you're, you point that little pizza dish to that place in the sky where that particular satellite is, okay? For internet, that kind of sucked because, again, you're talking about propagation delay. So, like, if you're talking about gaming on a satellite line, oh, my gosh, you're, you know, there's, you can't respond fast enough. On, and then you're just going to get, you know, like if you're playing Counter-Strike or something, you're just going to lose, Okay. Uh, because there's a delay in, in when, you know, when you tap the button and then you get the feedback you get, you have a bit of a delay. That's this whole idea with these low Earth orbit satellites that Elon Musk is doing. The thing is, if you have satellites way up high, you only need a few of them. But the lower you go, you need to have more satellites to cover, uh, you know, the same area. So that's why they're talking about putting up thousands of satellites. Um, and then these satellites will be almost as if you know, as if you had a wired line, which is kind of uh, uh, kind of a cool idea. So anyway, yeah, so satellite um, usually uses microwave to transmit uh, signals from the terrestrial uh, to up to the satellite and then back down. Very cool. Okay, next, um, cell technology for internet access. Okay, again, uses microwave. Uh, usually the cell goes to a cell tower, but then it goes down to a ground line from there. Okay, so that the cell really is just to kind of capture the call. And it's interesting, I don't know if you've ever looked into cellular technology, but the way that these towers do the handoffs between where you're going and as you're moving, these towers basically hand off your signal to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and so forth. Um, as a matter of fact, I was uh, watching a show on Netflix about um, you know, spy technology. And one of the things that, um, you know, is pretty popular for you know, spies and things to do is to create a fake cell site at an airport, for example, as you're getting off the airplane, so that when you are turning your cell phone on, um, the first strongest signal tower that they're going to get to, so it's like a fake tower, um, is theirs. And so they can, you know, kind of take a hold of that data and unencrypt it and yada, yada, yada. But that, that's kind of an interesting idea. And they said that there's lots and lots of airports that basically um, this is going on at. So, you know, we're not immune. There's a company that makes those called Harris Radios. Oh, is that right? And the city of San Jose uses them. Is that right? So is that part of the 4G yeah. rollout or whatever? I don't know, but they can get all your data in San Jose. I'm telling you, man. That, yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. And they can actually load your phone up with other things, too. So, you know, folks, that's going to be like um, that. This a thing is phone viruses. OK, so like know that. And like, you know, there's stuff on your phone that that we don't even realize is like really happening. Um, so, you know, kind of that's going to be, you know, you're going to hear more and more about that as time goes on. So, you know, is, anyway. it, um, is yeah. it tech in the tower that hands off the signal? Or is it your phone that decides which tower it's connected to? So basically, it, uh, the, uh, the towers work together because they know usually where the other tower is and where to do the handoff and so forth. And so they have different algorithms to decide on which way they're going to uh, send it. Because your phone basically does not necessarily know where it's pointing. It's just, it's just omnidirectional. It's just going to kind of throw the signal out. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. You know, see, that's the thing about wireless technology, guys, is that when you're using wireless, basically what's happening is you're just transmitting all of this stuff to everybody out there. Now, most of the time, like at home, for example, that's why you need to use um, some kind of encryption. OK, that's why it's super important, because otherwise you can just grab this stuff out of the air and read it and, and, and what have you. So. So wireless is, you know, kind of uh, is a bit vulnerable. Um, like, for example, people using, the, we used to use this thing called WEP, okay, which was a wireless or wired equivalent privacy knot. Um, and so WEP is so easily crackable, you can crack that in like 15 seconds, you know. Um, and so we don't use that anymore. And, you know, we're usually WPA2 now or, or you know, and higher uh, levels of encryption. 
Um, so, so at any rate, you know, kind of wireless, just know that you're throwing that all of that out there. So if you're throwing out encrypted stuff, uh, it's got to, what you want to do, there's no such thing as, some, as a completely secure network, guys, that does not exist. There's always a way in, whether it's a uh, vulnerability through uh, so, social kind of situation, or whether it's a technical situation, or if, you know, you can say, oh, well, the computer's not connected to the internet. Well, if I had access to the computer, you know, if I could pick the lock to the door that it's behind, I can still get a hold of it, hack that thing. Uh, but there is no such thing as a network that is completely secure. Okay, it's always spy versus spy. The good hackers are still in the system, guys. Okay, they're in, this, and we just don't, we don't know about it, right? So, um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. So, but you have to think about this. You know, like it kind of if you're worried about that, you know, basically I have this idea about you know, uh, Doctor Scott's good enough um, network. Um, privacy or, or network security, and you get yourself a good firewall, you get yourself good anti-malware, um, you know, and you update the anti-malware, and then, you know, you get um, good encryption, right? So um, what you want to do is basically, you, you know, be secure enough so that they, you know, they're, they're looking for open doors. Their hackers most of the time are lazy, unless there's a specific reason to hack a particular person, which, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a billionaire. I'm not really a person of interest. I'm not, you know, like why, you know, it kind of begs the question why, right? So as long as you're kind of covering the basic tracks of, of that kind of stuff, chances are that you're going to be safe. Okay. Because there's lots and lots of open doors out there. There's lots of people that aren't using encryption or not updating their, their anti-malware or clicking on the link or going to the dark places of the internet and, and so forth and clicking on all kinds of different stuff. Um, those are the victims. Um, and so we'll be talking more about security as we go, but, um, but just know that really, if a hacker really wanted to get a hold of your uh, system, you know, they could. I mean, if, like, if I really wanted to break into your house, I totally could. I could, you know, drive a truck through your garage door I mean, won't be the most elegant way to do it. I mean, and I'll attract all kinds of bullshit attention, but I could do it. You see what I'm saying? But what you do is you, you lock your door, you have a dog, you, you know, um, you turn the lights on at night, you know, so I'm not going to really be interested in your house. I'm looking for something that's got an open window that I can kind of sneak through. Right. That's kind of how hackers think a lot of times. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good stuff. All right. Moving on. How are we doing on time? We're good. All right. Good. So uh, hotspots and tethering, right? So now you can use your um, phone as a hotspot and it works really well. Um, if you have good um, cellular coverage, you can use that as, uh, you know, basically pack it over cellular and it does a really good job. Just remember that it's, you know, that all of that data stream does count towards your, you know, hours or minutes or whatever you have kind of set up. Um, but, but, um, I would try it if you haven't tried it yet. Um, it's really cool. And if like, say if your internet goes out at home, you can use your cellular and, um, that's kind of like a backup. Um, and it's, and it's pretty cool. Cool beans. All right. Let's see what we're having doing. Okay. Connection types. Um, okay. So technologies that use different frequencies to send multiple signals over the same medium, that would be a broadband, but let's see broadband. Here we go. Digital phone service that is all connect to the internet. That would be like DSL. Um, okay, uses coaxial cables to deliver a variety of content, including uh, cable TV, internet, and voice. That would be a cable. Good. Let's see. Increasingly popular choice for internet connections to homes and businesses that uses light transit media. That is fiber. Yes. A popular choice for rural markets that do not have DSL or cable uh, provider, that would be a satellite. Um, uses towers distributed through users coverage areas to provide seamless access to phone and internet services would be cellular. The process of connecting another device uh, to a cell phone can use that would be a mobile hotspot. Let's see, wait, or tethering. Let's say cell phone configured to allow other devices. Do I have this right tethering and mobile hotspot? Let's see if I do. My, my hotspot's the Wi-Fi. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Hotspots. Uh, okay. Gotcha. So let's do tethering here and then hotspot here. Thank you for your help. Excellent. Boom. All right. Good job. Excellent. 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 Very nice. Okay. Let's take a look at this video. Um, 
in order to basically understand and make sense of what's going on when we transmit data from one machine to another machine, basically what they do is they divide it and they talk about a logical model. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about a logical model of what's happening and with the idea of layers. Okay. Um, and it's, it's illogical in the way that it's not exactly the same, what's happening on the bit level, but, uh, but to understand what's happening, we're going to be talking about how, data goes from one machine to another machine and um and whether or not it is going to be like a it, it checks itself to make sure that it's all correct or whether it just sends the data out so let's take a look we're going to be looking at the transport layer protocols in particular tcp and udp okay boom network communications involves a suite of protocols known as the internet protocol suite or more commonly known as the TCP IP protocol suite. This protocol suite includes all the protocols used in various aspects of end-to-end -end network communications, including addressing, routing, and reliability. The TCP IP protocol suite is also a conceptual model that classifies and organizes the various protocols into four different layers, network access, internet, transport and application. The transport layer includes two protocols, TCP, transmission control protocol, and UDP, user datagram protocol. These protocols determine how the data will be delivered, reliably or unreliably. It is up to the network application to choose. If the application chooses TCP, the data will be delivered reliably with guaranteed delivery and assembled in the proper order. Or it can choose UDP when the data needs to be delivered as quickly as possible with some tolerance for loss of data. TCP adds some overhead, which means there will be some additional delay. For example, the network application HTTP uses TCP to make sure all the data is delivered reliably. Here the user types in the URL www.mybank.example. TCP is used to transport the information reliably between the user's computer and the web server. The web server, also using TCP, sends the requested data, the web page, in separate segments. Each segment includes a sequence number so the receiver knows if anything is missing and so it can assemble it in the proper order. UDP is a simpler protocol used to send data as quickly as possible, even if some data doesn't get delivered. Guys, think streaming, like streaming media for UDP. Network applications, such as those used for sending voice and real-time video, can sacrifice some data loss in order for the data to be delivered as quickly as possible. As you can see, UDP does not include any functions for reliability, such as there are no sequence numbers in the UDP segments. To summarize, the applications such as those that perform file transfers, downloading web pages, and email, all use the reliable transport protocol TCP. Whereas UDP is used for applications such as real-time video and voice, where speed is more important than reliability. All right, so basically the takeaway from that is that uh, TCP is a reliable protocol and UDP is fast, but not as reliable because it just sends out the packets, okay? So for example, if you're watching Netflix and you happen to miss a couple of the packets that are going out of the segments, they call it, uh, it's not going to ruin your day. Now, if you're doing online banking and you don't get those, you know, that decimal point in the right fucking place, you, that's gonna ruin your day, okay? So they're gonna use UDP, uh, user data ground protocol for that. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, transmission control protocol. Okay, transmission control protocol is almost like certified mail, if you will. Um, it checks each uh, packet and so forth and make sure that it gets delivered in sequence and um, that they all get there. Uh, so we'll get more into that as we go. And you saw that the um, TCP um, IP model is divided into these four parts. Uh, we'll get into more of that as well. So 
interesting stuff. Okay. So let's take a look and let's see if we can figure this out together. The transport, this transport layer has only one protocol like the internet layer. That is false. It has, right? It has two protocols, TCP and UDP, okay? Some application layer protocols uh, use only the UDP. Is that true? So they, we, now I know we don't know about the application layers and stuff yet, but um, then we're gonna say, we're gonna say that's gonna be true, okay? Some application layer protocols can use both TCP and UDP. Well, let's try and see if they say yes or what. Uh, some can use either TCP or UDP depending on the uh, purpose of the traffic. Uh, some application layer protocols can use neither TCP nor UDP. I'm gonna say that that's gonna be false because you need to use one, okay? One, one or, or the other um, or both. Show me, okay, I think we did it. Okay, beautiful, beautiful, moving on, all right. Okay, so here is an example. And again, basically this is a, a logical model, okay? When they talk about the network access layer, okay, they're talking about the actual physical connection of the, the wire or wireless, okay? So this is actually the physical connection. It also includes things like um, what they call your MAC address. And we're gonna get into that. Uh, MAC, not for Macintosh, but media access control. It's a number that you have burned into your network interface. Um, all of us do um, a different number, a unique in the world. Um, and it, it uh, switches operate on that layer. Um, the IP layer, right? So this is where you have an IP address. Um, and what happens is this is where your internet addressing goes. And I have a really good, I think um, by next time, I'm going to put together a lecture for you guys about really how this whole thing works and how, how information goes from one computer to the other computer and how it can even find its way through that maze. Um, we just talked about the transport layer. The transport layer really is about um, the type of the way that we're going to send the data from one place to another. And then we have the application layer. So let me explain this in a different way. Let's say this is one computer, okay? If I'm sending information to another computer or sending the data, it goes from the application all the way down the stack and over to the other machine. And then it gets to the other machine and it goes up the stack, okay? Uh, so let's see what, this, what happens in this other figure here. Okay, so again, just, just to um, emphasize, okay, so we have um, what happens with transmission control protocol, that's the reliable one. Okay, things like your email, things like web, HTTP, HTTPS um, happens on over TCP, okay? It's reliable, it acknowledges the data, it resends the lost data, like I didn't get number five packet of, you know, five of five, I didn't get five, so resend it please, you know, kind of thing. Delivers data in sequenced order, okay? Now UDP, user datagram protocol, streaming Netflix, Okay, uh, IP telephony. Okay, so I'm um, talking on the phone. Um, it does not necessarily matter if you miss a, you know, uh, a couple of the packets and so forth. It's not going to mess up your, your, um, your banking. It's not going to mess up your, your critical information. Okay, so fast, low overhead doesn't require acknowledgments and uh, doesn't resend lost data and delivers as it arrives. It's a boom. It just it's like a fire hydrant. Just sends it out. Boom. Okay, so more about TCP. TCP, the transport uh, is analogous to sending packages that are tracked from source to destination. Let's see this little video and then we're almost ready for a break. I've, um, let's see, uh, they're gonna do the UDP, we could do that, TCP, UDP, and we'll take a break. Here we go. Okay, so file sent to a server using the file transfer protocol, FTP application, TCP tracks the conversation. So again, it says it, the first three of six segments are forwarded to the server, okay. And the file server acknowledges, I got the first three segments, right? Okay. And then the client forwards the next three segments, okay? Um, no segments are received, what's going on? So it's gonna complain. So um, it's gonna send them again, okay? The final three segments are received and acknowledged. So, you know, so if, this, if the user doesn't get the acknowledgement that the server received those packets sent, it's gonna send them again, okay? Um, very cool. So let's move on to, I guess UDP should be next. Okay, UDP. Here's what happens in UDP. It's just going to go, wham, it's going to send them out. It doesn't care. File is sent to a server using, a, there we go, boom, 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 boom. Server doesn't care. It just says, I, I either got them or I didn't. 
server receive all six, no acknowledgement sent. Great. Okay, and then it say they only got five of six or whatever. It doesn't. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. Okay. Boom. All right. Next is um, let's do our check our understanding. And we'll take a break. Okay. Does not require acknowledgments. That's going to be you. Tell me this time, guys. UDP. UDP. All right. Delivers data as it arrives. UDP. UDP. It's reliable. TCP. TCP. Good. It's fast. UDP. You got it. Resends, resends lost data. TCP. TCP. Good. Delivers data in sequence order. TCP. TCP. Low overhead. UDP. Right. Does not resend lost data. UDP. UDP. Right? Acknowledges data. TCP. 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 Very good. Excellent job. Let's check it. Very nice. All right, folks. It is 647. So let's go ahead and take a break until seven o'clock. Um, take a little bit longer because you earned it. Um, and um, I will see you back then um, and save questions. I might have a really cool video for us when we come back. All right, so we'll see you back at seven. Okay. Recording, here we go. All right, now we go. Great. TCP and UDP Whoa, use wow. source and destination port numbers to keep track of application conversations. Every network application is identified by the transport protocol using a well-known port number. The source port number is associated with the application that originated the request known as the client computer. The destination port number is usually a well-known port number associated with the destination application on the remote device, the server computer. In this example, the user has entered the URL www.netacad into their web browser. The web browser is sending the information using the network application protocol HTTP which uses the transport protocol, TCP. The user's operating system has selected the TCP source port 1024 to refer to any communications coming from this specific web browser window or process. It is also using the well-known TCP destination port 80 so the www.netacad.com web server knows this data is for its HTTP application. After receiving the request from the client, when the www.netacad.com web server sends the client the data it has requested, it will be sent from its TCP source port 80. In other words, from its HTTP application. When sending the data to the client, the server will use the client's TCP source port as the TCP destination port, in this case, port 1024. This is so the client knows which specific application, the specific web browser window or tab, this data is intended for. If the client opens up a separate browser window, in this case, entering the URL www.cisco.com, a different TCP source port number will be associated with this specific web browser window. In this case, TCP source port 1555. Although the HTTP request message will be sent to a different server, the same well-known TCP destination port number 80 is used to indicate this is for the HTTP application. When the www.cisco.com web server sends the specific client the data it has requested, it will be sent from its TCP source port 80, its HTTP application. The server will use the client's TCP source port as the TCP destination port, port 1555. 
When the client receives this information, it examines the destination port number to know which browser window the data is intended for. Okay, now I know that's a whole, that's a big pill to swallow and not, there's, there's a lot to that. And um, so I recommend watching that video a couple times, but let me just add something about ports. It's a fictitious idea. It's like almost like tuning a radio. Basically the port information is sent along in ones and zeros along with the datagram that's going down the wire. And basically it, it, it notifies this receiving piece of equipment um, that it's listening on a particular channel so that if, if, if it sees that number, it's, it pays attention to it, okay? So I would recommend watching that a couple more times just to understand, basically you have a port that you send on and then a port you receive on. It's almost like a CB radio, okay? It's like, you, but you have a channel that you're sending out information on and then another channel that you're receiving information on, okay? Um, but the channels, like, they don't really exist. They're just, num they're coded numbers, okay? Um, and so that's what's a little bit strange because, like, like, there's no physicalness of it. There's no particular place that you plug into this port. It's, it's all done with ones and zeros, okay? And a port is almost just like a coded um, message, okay? So it's coded to go to a particular, someone that's listening to that particular code. Um, so we'll get more into that as we go. Okay, um, so there are particular ports that these uh, services on the web use, and this is why you can't just open up a port when you're playing a video game, um, just, it's just any arbitrary number, okay? So for example, port 53 is commonly used for TCP and UDP for DNS, okay? What the hell is DNS? Well, DNS stands for Domain Name Service. And DNS is what allows us to have a, a name instead, like for example, like Santa Rosa.edu instead of 17.54.32.1, which would be difficult for most people to remember. We can actually remember a name. The DNS is like a giant virtual phone book out on the web. And they, instead of acknowledging, um, numbers to names uh, it acknowledges well it, it does acknowledge it, it 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 names to numbers okay so it so when you're looking for google.com it sends back the number and that that's the way that we use dns um we'll we get more into that as we go port 80 is commonly used for http traffic okay that's um um, these days anymore, most of the time web traffic is done not on port 80, but on HTTPS, which is uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure on Secure Sockets Layer 443, okay? So that port 443 is the Secure Sockets Layer port for HTTPS, okay? Let's take a look at some more of these ports. These are just common ports. Port 25 is used for SMTP traffic, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Okay, we'll learn more about these as we go. Port 110 is used for POP3 or post office protocol, old style email. Uh, port 143 is used for IMAP or internet message access protocol. We'll do some IMAP commands and have some fun with that. 389, port 389 is used for LDAP or lightweight directory access protocol used to maintain user identity, directory information, and can be shared across networks and systems. Uh, LDAP, um, do you have to memorize these? No. Um, how I would be familiar with port 443. I would be familiar with the, with the FTP. Um, and I would be familiar with, let's see, out of these, um, make sure, not, not make sure, but I would be familiar with, let's go to one here. Um, 443 for, um, HTTPS port 80 for HTTP. Those are, um, common, maybe on the test kind of thing. Um, what else? Um, SMTP port 25. Um, let's see, uh, probably not pop three, but maybe, um, and then FTP port 21. Um, and then you have some other thing, Apple filing protocol, kind of arbitrary, but, uh, 548 port 445 is used for SMB server message block or common internet file system, uh, port 21. So again, out of all of these, you know, FTP port 21, um, those, the, the, the other two I talked about, um, Secure shell, okay, that's port 22, okay. Uh, Telnet is port 23, 
okay? Uh, RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, developed by Microsoft, it uses port 3389. How can it all of a sudden jump to 3389? It doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. It's a number that we just agree upon, okay? So if your company decides to make a new technology and use a particular port, it'd be a good idea to make sure that nobody else is really using that port and so forth. That's why a lot of times when you're um, playing a game, you need to use a port, you know, 5,628 or something like that. Um, okay, so here's some more common ports. Port 67 and 68 are used for DHCP. What the heck is DHCP? DHCP is RAD, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. DHCP is what allows the server or a DHCP service to assign an IP address to your device so that you don't have to go to every single one of your computers on your network and do all that um, assigning of IP addresses by hand. It just does it automatically, very cool. Uh, Net BIOS uh, over TCP IP, um, basically uh, data link kind of protocol things, port 137 to 139. Um, simple mail, uh, simple network management protocols, SNMP uses 161 and 162. Uh, SLP, service location protocol. So, you know, be a good idea to take this, these charts and uh, do a screen grab. You guys know how to do, um, uh, basically you use, um, my favorites is the snipping tool. Have you you've done that before? Uh, let me share my desktop vertical quick here. Let's show you what I would do. Okay, so let me do a different share sharing the whole desktop for a second share the screen okay and say share okay so what i might do is something like this i would grab the snipping tool so i'll go over here to start and i'm going to type s n i p that'll give me the snipping tool okay there's probably a better way to do it whatever i'm just doing it this way so snipping tool here we go so snipping tool pops up and i say okay new snip okay and then it changes my screen to this and then i just kind of scroll over this whole thing now it puts it into the snipping tool and I go edit, copy, okay? And I like to use PowerPoint for my notes because I can do them all six up or something like that. So let me open up a PowerPoint, okay? And let's see, save that. Okay, open, I gotta say, I gotta open up a new one. Not a problem, okay? And what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to uh, just open up a blank presentation, for example, and insert a new slide after the title slide, I'll change that later and then just, um, Control V to paste, and that's going to put that right right here. Okay, I would put that into your notes, and that way you have it. It's pretty cool. Um, um, you know, and that way, if there is anything that you should memorize and so forth, just highlight it. You know, and and that way you can you can do that. So let me just share back to our um, our presentation here. Good stuff and good. All right, so. Um, we still have more now. <laughs> Here we go. Here is the larger table. Application protocols in port order number. Okay, so we get TCP, what is it? FTP, Secure Shell, Telnet, Simple Mail, DNS, you know, all of these numbers here. Um, so what would be important? I would know FTP, maybe Secure Shell. Um, I would know DHCP might be useful to, to have memorized. Um, HTTP. I would know HTTPS. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I, simple ma uh, mail, simple mail, SMMP, um, we talked about. Yeah, that's, that's what I would do. Anyway, there is that. So um, don't worry about memorizing all of them because the network guys don't even necessarily, or the network gals don't even have them all memorized either. So. There's that. Maybe some of them do. Okay, instructions. Okay, now we got to match them. Okay, okay. Identify which applications use TCP, UDP, or both by making selections in appropriate columns. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, does FTP use TCP, UDP, or both? I don't know. You, shall we try? What What do you think? Let's just Let's just throw caution to win. Let's see both. It's TCP. TCP, okay, good, there you go. Okay, FTP, uh, this FTP data, FTP control, TCP, UDP, or both? TCP. Probably TCP. Um, secure shell, probably what? TCP. TCP, you know, secure kind of gave it away. Telnet. TCP. TCP. Uh, simple mail. TCP. TCP and DNS, probably TCP, I would imagine. Let's check, no, what do you think? UDP? 
Well, it's got to use some UDP, oh. I would think. Let's check it. Check. Hey, shit. Yeah. Damn. All right. We got more, though. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good, good, good. All right. More. All right. DHCP server. Okay. So is that TCP, UDP, or both? I think both. I'm going to guess both. A server, both. Client, both. Let me check it real quick. Check. Oh, shit. I got it wrong. What do you guys think? Oh, damn. Okay, UDP. Wow. Okay. Uh, TFTP. That's UDP. UDP. Excellent. HTTP. TCP. TCP. Okay, POP3. TCP. TCP. Uh, Net BIOS. Both. Both. Okay. It's actually, I'm... wait a minute. No, that's TCP. Oh, is it TCP? Okay, we'll yeah. do that. And then IMAP. Internet Message Application Protocol. TCP. TCP. All right, let's check our work. You guys are good. Okay, let's take a look at the wrong one. We got uh, net bias in this. Uh, maybe that's both. Let's try that. Check it, check it, check. Oh. check it. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's that's kind of what's happening there. Let's do the last one. Boom. Okay, um, SNMP. Um, data. Oh, UDP. Okay. UDP. Okay, let's try that. LDAP. Both. Both okay, SLP. Both, both okay. Uh, HTTPS secure 443 socket slayer to uh, TCP, both. TCP. Uh, or both, 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 or TCP. What do you think? I think TCP. Okay, let's do it. Uh, SMB and CIFS TCP. Okay, uh, AFP. I think that's TCP. Okay, and then RDP. Uh, UDP. Okay, UDP. Let's try this and see how we do. Check it, check, check. Wow, okay, so let's see what we got incorrect. Okay, HTTPS. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that's probably both. Let's check that again. Yep, okay. And then RDP, let's try both on that and say oh, check yeah. that. All right, so that's what that looks like. Okay, um, cool. All right, moving on. Um, you know, I think that uh, snipping tool even works on my screen. So you can you can snag it from my screen if you wanted to. So there, there the answer's done um, if you wanted. Anyway, just, just ideas. Okay, moving on. Okay, um, comparing 802.11 standards. What the heck are they talking about? So um, IEEE, the Institute for Electronic and Electric Engineers, okay, has a series of standards for all kinds of things. The 802.11 standard really talks about um, wireless technologies. Now, when wireless was just getting started, it wasn't as good as it is now. And so they have the first standard, then they have the second standard, and then they have, you know, so um, let's take a look at those, okay? Now, um, so 802.11a, the speed, maximum speed was 54 megabits per second, okay? The range was 115 feet. And the frequency was five gigahertz. Now, the first one that came out actually was 802.11b at 11 megabits using 2.4 gigahertz. What else uses 2.4 gigahertz? Anybody? Phones do. Like, you know, if you have a cordless phone, that, that does. Um, my wireless guitar uses, you know, so every time I turn my wireless bass on, it kicks me off the internet. I, you know, I don't like that sometimes. So there's interference sometimes with that. Um, so that's 11B, uses 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 802.11A, okay? So if you have a, a range extender or even your network interface on your computer, you're probably more likely wanting to use the 5 gigahertz range because it's faster. Now, cable is the fastest, okay? So if you have a choice, it, you plug the cable into your laptop or, or device. That's gonna be faster because you're gonna be sharing the bandwidth with all of the other computers that are connected wirelessly. You have to share that. And so if one of your roommates is streaming something off of Netflix and then another roommate streaming something else off of Netflix and you're trying to get, you know, download whatever you're trying to download, it's going to be slower because um, you know, it's going to be a lot faster if you use your, your wire um, network. Uh, 802.11G, 54 megabits, 125 feet, uses 2.4 um, it's backward compatible with 802.11b. Now, we also have 802.11n, and n is kind of algebraic, meaning number or whatever, meaning kind of placeholder. 600 megabits uh, on that. 
a uh, range of 230 feet or 70 meters. It's awesome. It uses 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range. Okay. Um, it's backwards compatible with A, B, and G. Okay. Now, um, 802.11 AC. Okay. New, newer one. 1.3 gigabits. So, so a giga is billion, right? Uh, with a B. So instead of mega, which is million, you got 1.3 gigabits, 115 foot range. And it uses. So now with your mobile devices, okay, uh, what we're going to be talking about is um, um, different technologies that use kind of wireless um, technology. So, like we have Bluetooth. Um, you understand that Bluetooth devices operate in the 2.4 to 2.485 gigahertz frequency and typically used by personal area networks, right? I'm just kind of reading right off the chart here. Um, let's see. Um, oh, basically, Bluetooth incorporates adaptive frequency hopping, AFH. AFH allows signals to hop around using different frequencies with the 2.4 to 2.485 range, thereby reducing the chance of interference with uh, multiple Bluetooth devices are present. You know, interestingly enough, there was an actress that actually was um, was one of the inventors of frequency hopping. Um, and I'm trying to remember her name. This was back in the 50s, I think. Um, um, I will think of it. And um, so she's one of our computer heroes and so forth, or um, telecom heroes. Um, RFID, right? So we've heard of that. RFID uses frequencies within 125 megahertz to 960 megahertz range to uniquely identify items in a shipping department, as an example, or RFID tags, or, you know, the COVID booster that you just got. No, I'm not, not, not saying that, just teasing. Doesn't know. Uh, passive RFID tags, um, you know, you see these in, in books and on clothing and, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm not political. I'm not even going to go there. I just, uh, all that stuff makes me sick almost. Okay, NFC. All right. NFC uses frequencies 13.56 uh, megahertz as a subset of RFID. So what is NFC? NFC is designed to be a secure method to complete transactions. Have you guys used Apple Pay? Pretty awesome. Or Google, whatever the hell it is. Um, kind of neat that you could just pay with your device. That's pretty cool. So yeah, there's that. How many of you heard of Zigbee? Huh? Zigbee. Oh yeah. Zigbee and Z-Wave. So Zigbee uses low power digital radios uh, based on the IEEE 802.15.4, believe it or not. Uh, basically talking about the internet of things, these devices in your home, or what we call the internet of insecure things, right? So um, if I find out what the pa uh, your password is for one of your devices, I could take over your home and your locks and your lights and your blah, blah, blah. And it would be fun. Cut that out of the video. Shit. All right. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Instructions. Cellular technology uses cell phone network to connect to the internet. Performers will be limited by capabilities. So let's see. So cellular generation. So they're going to talk to us about the generations, right? So, you know, because everybody's like, we're so worried about 4G because it's going to mess up our channeling our spirit guides or some shit like that. I don't know. Um, so, but, you know, I'll tell you what, there is a good argument about 4G um, with um, the aviation industry. And they're talking about um, crosstalk and, and, and that affecting the um, navigation equipment of, of big jets and things like that. And so, you know, I think that might be a deal. Um, Having said that, let's take a look at what they mean. Okay, so 1G and 2G, okay? 1G, of course, stands for first generation. First generation of cell phones were analog voice calls. Now, this was the great day because you could get a spectrum analyzer. I used to work at HP, which is wonderful. And um, we used to work on spectrum analyzers, which whatever, but like it's a radio from God, okay? You get every single channel and all this kind of stuff. You could listen to all these cell phone conversations back in the day on all these different channels because they were analog and you could just like snoop in and stuff or they hear the juicy shit. Um, and so, but what happened was people knew that that was happening. So we have to basically start doing digital. So that's when the kind of the digital came in. So 2.5G supports web browsing, short audio and video clips. You download the applications and ringtones, okay? Um, 3G supports full motion video, streaming music and 3D. So now we're not using analog anymore. Um, 
and uh, 144 kilobits. So kilo is a thousand, so 144,000 bits per second to two megabits, two million bits per second, okay? Now 3.5G, okay, supports high quality streaming video. High, most of, mostly we're around our area, it's like 3.5 going to four. Um, VoIP technology, that's how you pronounce that. Um, voice over IP, um, it, it does that. Speed of 400 kilobits to 16 megabits per second, depending. Um, here's our 4G, okay? 4G supports IP-based voice gaming services, high quality streaming, um, IP version six. Um, IP, you know, that's that's a big deal. Um, no, no cell phone carriers could meet the 4G standards uh, when it first announced in 2008. So we're kind of getting there. Um, speed at uh, 5.8 megabits. Now we have also have LTE, long-term evolution, is designated for a 4G technology, you know, and so forth. Again, with different speeds. So you understand just generation speed, the things get better. Now, um, there is a great video and um, I'm gonna add it, not now, but um, I wanna add it to our IT Essentials playlist. Well, I'll just put the video up. It's actually really good and talks about the actual technological kind of issues that that might come up, if any. OK, um, check our understanding wireless protocols. OK, so let's do that. A legacy WLAN standard with a maximum speed of 54 megabits per second. Is that going to be 54 megabits? A, is that A? 802.11G. 802.11G, baby. All right, good. The standard that all WLAN should use when implementing new devices. 802.11ac. Okay, let's try that out. Okay. A wireless PAN technology that supports up to seven connected devices. Bluetooth. Bluetooth. A tag reader system that can accommodate ranges for 25 meters for passive tags up to 100 meters for active tags. RFID. RFID, beautiful. Okay, a secure closed proximity transaction system. NFC. NFC, good. All right, a proprietary home standard that can support 232 connected devices in the same wireless mesh network. Z-Wave. Z-Wave is the well, proprietary one, right? Okay, a smart home standard that has a, some open source code, 802.11.15.4. Zigbee. Okay, technology that meets the standards for fourth generation mobile phones. LTE. LTE and cellular technology that supports up to three gigabits download to 1.5 gigabits as upload. Okay, so let's try this. See how we do. Yes, you guys rule. Badassery, the epitome of badassery. Okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, we're going to watch this video and then we're going to bag out um, and... Um, um, having a great class and I'm just, I'm kind of, I always have a good time with you, but uh, here we go. Uh, DHCP, DNS, and HTTP. DHCP is cool as shit and so is DNS and HTTP. So check this out. A client computer uses client software to request the service of a server. The server computer uses server software to provide services to one or more clients. DHCP or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol is a network service that allows a DHCP server to provide addressing information to client computers. This DHCP client has been configured to obtain its addressing information automatically from a DHCP server. This is the default on most user computers and devices. The DHCP client sends a DHCP request message asking the DHCP server for this information. The DHCP server may be a local router or a server computer. The DHCP server will then respond with the appropriate addressing information. This will include a specific IP address for the client and can also include an address for the default gateway and a DNS server. DNS, or Domain Name System, mm -hmm. is a network service that provides an IP address for a known domain name, such as a URL. In this example, the user has entered the URL www.netacad.com into a web browser. 
However, to request this information from the web server, the client needs to know the IP address of the web server. The client sends the DNS server a DNS request message asking for the IP address associated with the domain name www.netacad.com. The DNS server will determine the answer and respond to the client's request with the proper IP address. The client can now send its HTTP request to the www.netacad.com web server. HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, is a network service that provides for the delivery of worldwide web messages between a client web browser and a web server. The HTTP client using a web browser requests the information associated with a specific URL from a web server. The HTTP server or web server responds by sending the client the files associated with this specific website. This may include HTML code, images, audio, and video. Okay, so again, I know it's like a lot, but you just, I have a wonderful um, little lecture that is going to demystify a lot of this stuff. And um, so we'll, we're gonna get there. So um, anyway, in the meantime, watch the videos a couple times because it's just kind of just to wrap your head around kind of what's going on. It just takes a second, but the more and more exposure that you get to this, um, it'll start to make sense. Some of you like this is old hat and, and you know, been doing there, been there, done that. But for the rest of us, um, you know, like got it, re reading it, re looking at it, looking at internet resources, going to say um, Professor Messer or something like that as well, or reviewing the videos that we put together whatever it takes. Um, now, um, I'm gonna let us go. I'm gonna stick around if anybody has questions, but thank you for a wonderful week. Uh, really enjoyed the lecture tonight and um, what a class, you guys. Now I have open chapter six, uh, five and six, as well as the checkpoint exercise for that. So that's where we're at. Um, see you next week. All right, thank you. Bye everybody. Good stuff. I'm going to turn the recording off now.